students who are also honored guests. We are going to get our colloquium underway. I have about um, you know, eight after, and we want to start on time as closely as possible. You all should have a program, and the uh, first item on the agenda is our invocation. Oh, by the way, I'm Uhuru Hotep. I'm serving as the Masters of Ceremonies, and I also serve as the Associate Director of the Michael P. Weber Learning Skills Center and the Gus and Spirit and Division of Academic Program. This is my ninth opportunity to be involved with this wonderful program. And it's a, um, a project initially of the our English faculty in the Gus and Spirit and Division. They're the ones who came up with the idea that a, having a colloquium or an opportunity for students to share uh, their research, their scholarly inquiry would be a nice feature of the Gus and Spirit and Division. And the division is always receptive to student and faculty recommendations for improving our program. So we embrace this notion of a colloquium with wide open arms, and, and lo and behold, nine years later, we are still at it, and we'll continue. So without further ado, I want to bring to the podium one of our faculty, Miss Linda Donovan, who's also a campus minister, campus minister here at Duquesne University, and one of our esteemed faculty members. Ms. Donovan. Thank you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> Dear God, we ask your blessings tonight on our gathering and on each one of us. We ask that you bless our students who are present, the parents who are present, and those who are presenting. Take away their stresses, not only tonight as they present their work, but the weeks to come as they face finals and finish the semester. We ask for confidence, grace, and assurance and all good things for all of us. Amen. Amen. Our colloquium is being live streamed and so we do have a, a virtual audience, an off-campus audience, audience for this event, and I want to welcome them as well. Next, we're going to have another one of our esteemed faculty members, GSD faculty members, uh, Mr. Rodney Lid, who is also a doctoral student here at Duquesne in the School of Communications and Rhetoric. He's going to provide us with a few opening remarks. Thank you, thank you. This is the time of year that many of us faculty and administrators have no idea whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening. So I need your help. Is it the morning, afternoon, or evening? All three. Okay, okay. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon. <laughs> now, if you could do me a favor, this would really help as I offer these remarks. Could you all stand? If, you, if you're able, could you all stand? Thank you very much. And as you stand, could everyone take a step first to your right, and then a step right back to where you started to your left? OK, please be seated. Thank you very much. I did that because the students who I've been learning with and teaching in public speaking know this, that this is a ceremonial speech, is it not? And one of the keys of a ceremonial speech is that my job is to move the audience. So guess what? I just moved you. <laughs> I just moved you. What a, you can tell people that when Instructor Lyde gave his remarks, it was an incredibly moving speech. 
I also want to thank Linda Donovan for that wonderful invocation and Dr. Hope Tep for being our MC. Now, to be sure, I'm proud and happy to give these remarks, but Dr. Hotep, I would not have minded being an MC because before I was a pastor and before I was a PhD student and instructor, many of you may not know, I was, in fact, an MC. Not a master of ceremony, but a rapper. <laughs> a Christian rapper. Some of you are not clapping means you don't believe me. Maybe I have to prove it. This was one of my rhymes, hands raised, give up the praise, once misbehave, but now I'm saved. Foots on the pavement, I'm walking highways on my way to heaven, live my life God's way. They call me the preacher, but I don't play. Prayer's my Mac 10, the word's my AK. I come with a grip that don't slip, got my hands on my hips, 66 books from my lips. Shot you, now I got you, feel the power of God stop you. Recognize this raw hide east side, eternal God, Lord on my side. Got Duquesne in the hood and it's all good on the rock, Lord Jesus Christ, I stood. Amen. See? <laughs> but in all seriousness, as Dr. Holden mentioned, I am Rodney Lyde. I am an instructor and a fourth year dissertation student, all but uh, dissertation in the Department of Communication and Rhetorical Studies. I have the pleasure of teaching uh, your children and your fellow classmates uh, public speaking, COM 102. I also teach business and professional communication. I teach a new course offered here called Politics, Communication, and Social Media. But more important than all that, I am proud to be a first-year adjunct instructor for the Gusson Spiritan Division, and what a proud honor I have. While I have been an instructor here at Duquesne for some years, I have to say that this semester has been one of the most rewarding teaching experiences that I've had. And these have been among the most enjoyable students that I've had. I say that because while it's always enjoyable to teach, it's wonderful when you get those students that you know you'll always remember. And so this has been a, a powerful experience. But I have to say that uh, when I was uh, encouraged to apply to become an instructor for the Gus and Spiritan Division, while I was familiar with Duquesne, I had never quite heard of the Gus and Spiritan Division. And I thought, if I didn't know, perhaps our audience did not know about the Gus and Spiritan, Spiritan Division. Can I tell you a little bit about it? All right. So the Gus and Spiritan Division uh, is aligned with Duquesne University, which was started by Spiritan Catholics. The Spiritan Catholics, which this university is founded upon, is a group of Catholics that believe in higher education and rooting themselves in the local context of a community. But the Gussens, Drs. Robert and Patricia Gussens, are those who started a program in 1997, serving more than 700 students through their incredible generosity. Their commitment, along with the universities, uh, to educational excellence, moral and spiritual values, and an ecumenical atmosphere committed to diversity and service to the community, to the nation, and to the church is what makes this all possible. So we, we should express, even in their absence, our gratitude for Robert and Patricia Gustin, because that is the evidence of people putting their faith into action. But with that being said, this is not just about uh, the ninth annual Gus and Spiritan Division Colloquium. It is, in fact, about the colloquium itself. This is the ninth. The word colloquium is an interesting word, and this is where, uh, this is where it's a wonderful thing to have a professor who is in communication and rhetorical studies, because we love, don't I not, students, I love breaking down words. Uh, the word colloquium comes from two parts, two Latin parts. The first is a root 
Latin word loquium, which means speaking. That means as we gather tonight for this colloquium, at the core of this is how the students are going to share the and speak about their scholarship and what they've learned. It's a time, if you will, of conversation, of dialogue, and of conference. But to me, to me, it's not just about the root word that's rooted in conversation and speaking. But I would say, Xavier, the most important part to me is the root word. The root word of colloquium is the prefix com, which means together. Think about that. That the power of tonight is that we are gathered here together. What a wonderful time. And is it not good for us to be here? I mean, you could have been in the other places, but isn't it really good for us to be here to celebrate the hard work of students, of faculty and administrators, to be here to celebrate and to applaud the efforts being made by students to advance themselves through education. I think that that is clap worthy. This idea of togetherness was indeed embodied by this commitment exhibited by students who, as I recall, started in the summer, right? And they were here intensively for the summer, then continued through this semester. I mean, that evidence is commitment, but more than that, they have gained friendships that I believe will last a, li a lifetime. To the students, I want to remind you of something that I hope and I'm sure you already know. It's a signal honor to be a part of GSD. Not everyone has been or can be accepted into the Gusson Spiritan Division. And so you have an opportunity to say about yourself, to put on your resume, uh, to carry with you something uh, that few people can say that you are a student in the Spiritan Division, the Gusson Spiritan Division at Duquesne University. But in addition to that, there are always people that no matter what we achieve, where we're, from where we come, what we accomplish, whatever things that we are able to say is attributed to us, remember this, there's always someone to thank. Am I right about that? There's always someone to thank, and if you're a student here or if you're online watching, I want you students to take a moment, whether you look at someone, you make eye contact, whether you text someone, I want you to take a moment right now and to thank someone that made this possible for you. It's a wonderful thing, is it not? We should all be grateful, <laughs> grateful for the ways in which people have helped us, lift us, sacrifice for us, to encourage us, to extend us grace. So over these past few months, the students have evidenced hard work and togetherness. And in fact, I'm so proud that we have this time of celebrating, this time of the ninth annual Gusson Spiritan Division Colloquium, where we can come together. Now, all of the students in the division are special. All of the students are bright in their own right, but tonight a few have been selected as representative samples of the best that GSD has to offer. So will you help me by now applauding those who will present, Sasha, Natalia, Liam, Xavier, Laura, Hans, and Frankie? Can we give them applause even before they give their presentations? Well, as knowing that I'm a preacher, I already know I've taken too much time because we have different clocks and different watches as preachers. Am I right about that, Pastor Stitch and, and Reverend Stitch? And so I'm sure that I've taken too much of your time, but let me leave you with this. When I think about the word colloquium, which reminds me of what it means to learn together, to learn from dialogue and conversation together, I'm reminded of a quote from Pope Francis. It, get, it was given during his homily at the second Vespers on the solemnity of the conversion of St. Paul in January of 2015. 
in that homily, he talks about the weariness of Jesus's journey. But even while he was on that journey, he did not hesitate to ask a Samaritan woman for something to drink. His thirst was more than physical, the Pope says. It says it was a thirst for an encounter with her and with others. It was a desire that he had to enter into dialogue with the woman and invite her to journey with him. But it, it was a journey that started not with the exterior, but with her interior. It's a reminder of the power of the patience of our Lord and the respect that he has for those who enter into his presence. And he closes this part of his homily with this phrase that I want to leave with you. It's about togetherness. He says, unity grows along the way. It never stands still. Unity happens when we walk together. Think about that. Unity happens when we walk together. But I would add this, not to say that his sermon was not complete in and of itself, but knowing now the power of colloquium, I would not only say that unity happens when we walk together, I would add that unity also happens as per colloquium when we talk together. Amen. Amen. So next, I'll turn things back over to our MC for tonight, <laughs> Dr. Hotep. And I say welcome and thank you for this opportunity. Grace and peace be unto you. Well, thank you, doctor, or soon to be doctor. Soon, yes, yes. Uh, Dr. White, that was a wonderful opening set of opening remarks, uh, more than what we paid for. <laughs> uh, but that's how you keep your job. <laughs> well, we're pleased to have seven presenters this evening. Each presenter will have approximately five to seven minutes to share the highlights of a, of a research paper they worked on this semester uh, and possibly began in the summer. And once all seven presenters are finished, we'll open the floor for 10 to 12 minutes or so of uh, Q&A. So you may want to take notes and um, have questions prepared to share with the audience and with the student presenters. Looking at our schedule and at the screen here, Natasha will be our first presenter. Uh, are you ready? Okay, come on up. <laughs> So today I wanted to show everyone that Greek mythology and Christian theology is very similar at times when it comes to the stories within them. For example, Adam and Eve and Pandora's box. Adam and Eve have, and Pandora's box have very, very similar ways the story goes. Adam and Eve were created in God's image. Pandora was created by the gods as a gift for Epimetheus because they're they had they had planning to go and punish Prometheus's brother Epimetheus because they just don't like Prometheus after they after he gave fire to humans Adam and Eve were not created with such cruel intent but they were still created by God Adam and Eve also had a similar thing with Pandora where they were not supposed to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They were supposed to eat from the tree of life. 
Pandora was gifted a box and she was told not to open it. She was very curious. She was made purposely to open this, but she was told not what was in it so that she would open it. Adam and Eve, again, weren't created to do such cool things. And what they did was more of an accident more than Pandora. Pandora, she eventually, when Epimetheus leaves one day, he, she opens the box and unleashes greed, envy, hatred, pain, disease, hunger, poverty, war, and death upon humanity. But she closes the box soon enough that hope doesn't leave the box. And so hope was left in the box so people would have hope to hold on to. Adam and Eve, they eat the apple from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they end up casted out of the Garden of Eden. But God later on gives people a chance to repent for what they did. Another example is Noah's Ark and the story of Decleon and Pyra. Noah was warned by God about a great flood. So was Decleon. He was warned by his father Prometheus of a great flood that the gods were going to send. Noah built an ark to survive the flood with all the animals. He gathered two of each animal on the boat and along with his family, and they survived the flood and started all over again. Decleon built a small boat for just him and his wife to survive the flood. And when they... When the flood eventually ended and they landed on a mountain, they went to the temple of Thesmus and were told to leave the temple and throw rocks behind them. And as they did, humans formed from the rocks, and over time, wild animals also came back. These, all these stories are very similar in the fact that they have to do with the same sort of story, but told with different people in different ways. Like Decleon, he built a small boat and he didn't save all the animals. But Noah built a large boat and saved all the animals. Uh, Pandora and Adam and Eve, they both were told not to do something, but they did it anyway. Of course, not due to cruel, more cruel reasons behind it like Pandora, but they still did it either way. I think mythology has roots that run all together along with theology. All major religions seem to have like stories that are very similar, and just Greek, and theo Greek mythology and Christian theology are just two big examples of stories that can cross each other. I wanted to thank you for listening to my speech today. Next, we have Liam, is that correct? The Reign of King David? Sasha. 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 Oh, okay. We're, we're, out, we're out of order here a little bit, but not a problem. All right, the Reign of King David, come forward. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sasha, and today I will be covering the Reign of King David. I'll be covering an overview of King David's time as God of Israel, along with his great accomplishments and what made him so popular among the Israelites. However, we can't address this time without addressing one of the great sins of the Old Testament, along with how, some, how someone with so much popularity and fame fell to God and asked for forgiveness. However, before all that, let's start from the beginning. Saul's fail failure to hold, uphold his duties as king by not killing the um, Amakites, especially the king Agad, this, this then leads to the start of the ban. The ban was a command that meant a sacrifice of all enemies of Israel and presents it to God as an offering. Saul did not follow through with this and was willing to allow the best to survive, going against God's wishes, making God very upset. Due to this, God appoints Samuel to find Saul's successor. 
This is when we meet David. Samuel anoints David as Saul's successor. Samuel chooses David because of his background and being a shepherd. He is the youngest of his lineage and is not initially introduced as an option to take over Saul's success. Samuel chooses King David with the hope that David's skills as a shepherd will reunite the 12 tribes of Israel. As a shepherd, David used to be a leader of a pact. By refusing to kill Saul, he sets a tone for his kingship. Although it does, not create, it does create some tension, his tribe of the south, Judean, rally around him, and shortly Judeans become associated with kingships and all things loyal. During his reign, by defeating Goliath, he becomes increasingly more popular among the Israelites, showing that no man or creature can defeat or hurt God's people. The leader of Israel takes human form and represents God on earth. By declaring Ju Jerusalem as the capital city and bringing the Ark Covenant back to Jerusalem that was originally stolen by the Philistines, he declares Jerusalem as the political and regional center. Even though there is no temple yet in Jerusalem, the God of Israel now dwells there. When Ta King David unifies the 12 tribes of Israel, he creates a kingdom along with a community among the Israelites. Here we see Diggs David's covenant and sin. David's covenant consists of three members, God, David's lineage, and David. The covenant is, a, is that the David's lineage will hold power forever. The wording forever is a tricky term because we know that the monarch of Israel comes to an end due to the Babylonians capturing David's tribes in the south during 586 BC. The sin. David commits adultery with a loyal soldier of Jerusalem's wife, Bathsheba, leading to what we now call David's sin. Human error comes into play, and King David tries to cover up the sin by killing Bathsheba, Bathsheba's husband. Although David repents his sins and is forgiven, God still feels he must pay. He loses his son, and now his lineage lives under the threat of the sword. David feels the weight of his sin through constant disappointment disappointment and betrayal after losing a son and another staging a coup to overthrow him. He is eventually exiled from Jerusalem by his own son. A summary. The biggest lesson learned from the book of Samuel is not about David, but about God's faithfulness to the people. Even though David commits adultery, it is theologically significant that God still keeps up his promise to the covenant and lets Solomon take over as king, who coincidentally enough is son to both David and Bathsheba. Because of the Israeli people, they see because of this the Israeli people see a temple and even more successful monarch. Thank you. Now, Mr. O'Mahony is going to share some information about two brothers, right? Cain and Abel, come forward. This is a tale of two brothers, both seeking the same end goal through similar means, that end goal being the approval of an authoritative figure who rules above all. When one brother achieves that goal, the other becomes hateful and makes a deal with something far worse than any devil, forcing him to live the rest of his life in eternal regret. This is the story of Cain, Abel, and the green-eyed monster. For those who don't know, the story begins with the two brothers as farmers, one of which tends to livestock and the other tends to the ground. When God calls upon them to bring forth offerings, Abel offers a newborn lamb and Cain offers some wheat. God accepts Abel's offering but rejects the wheat presented towards him. Cain becomes jealous of his younger brother and angry towards God. He brings Abel out into an open field and kills Abel while believing he would no longer have anything to worry about. Unfortunately for him, God has a presence everywhere and sees everything. The story of Cain and Abel is reminiscent 
of the story of Adam and Eve in the beginning of Genesis. Because in Genesis, Adam and Eve committed sin and tried to hide it from God, but were given a second chance in a way that was not as opportunistic as their previous one. Most notably, they were not killed for committing their sins. Cain suffers the same situation after he commits sin, lies to God, and then is sent to wander the world for eternity while bearing the mark of Cain. The author of Genesis chose this story to add in to teach multiple lessons to the reader. Not only does this story describe the sin that it describes a sin that should be avoided, but it also describes behaviors that could be harmful to more than just God. It tells a tale of arrogance, narcissism, hatred, and ignorance while still keeping the story relatively meaningful. While the story starts with the two brothers giving their offerings, it is pointed out that Abel did offer a new a newborn lamb that was in prime condition while the the wheat that Cain offered was simply some old scraps that he was going to throw away anyway. In, o in Oxford's Catholic Study Bible, they state the Lord looked in with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and dejected. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why are you dejected? If you act rightly, you will be accepted, but if not, sin lies in wait at the door. Its urge is for you, yet you can rule over it. God offered some wisdom towards Cain that could have been very useful if taken. Yet Cain displayed ignorance after showing the extent of his narcissism. Cain turned his anger at God's decision toward his brother as he realized that he could not change the mind of the divine being that is above all. He believed that if he could, cha if he could not change God's mind, he would have to limit the competition. He said to Abel, let us go out in the field. They went out into a, rem into a remote field, and Cain killed Abel out of jealousy. Later, God asked Cain what happened to Abel, and Cain said the same thing that he had previously said to Adam and Eve. Am I my brother's keeper? God became furious when he found out what Cain had done, as soon as he sensed Abel's presence calling from the ground. God placed a curse upon Cain, forcing him to wander earth eternally. But Cain pointed out that someone would try to kill him during his wandering. God eased his fear by marking him with a sign that let anyone know not to kill him on his endless wandering. By the end of the story, Cain is gone, and the story of Adam and Eve continues without the two brothers. From the beginning, there is word choice that had shown some things that were not given to the reader immediately. Although Ain was, Abel was described as herder of flocks, Cain is described as a tiller of the ground, as well as keeper of the ground. After Cain kills Abel, God states, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Cain believed that he was able to hide his sin in the work that he was best at. Yet even though it was his territory to work with, he was not able to hide something from a being that not only sees everything, but is presented as being everything. No place in the world could hide Cain's sin from a being that is everything in the world. Eve ex in the, before Cain is born, Eve explains the name of Cain, which, is, which roughly translates to a statement of her and God producing something through the same form of creation that formed Adam and Eve. This statement becomes more understandable in retrospect when seeing that, is, that it uses the ability that at the time only Eve possessed and God's power of creation to form human life. At the, end of Gen at the end of the story of Cain and Abel, God speaks a sentence to Cain that is used as the curse to send him on his eternal wandering. The sentence is believed to roughly translate to the exact opposite of the sentence spoken by Eve, because instead of an act of creation, it was an act of destruction. Cain, uh, yeah. uh, God remains connected to Cain even after the murder, though, by burying him with that mark. The idea of 
meaningless violence is put into full perspective throughout the story. As already stated time and time again, Cain and Abel gave their offerings. God chooses one over the other. Cain kills Abel and then faces punishment. Although Cain's offer was not worth as much as Abel's, the choice of which offering to accept was actually seen as random in some instances. So Cain had not had no reason to actually be upset. God offered Cain advice that could have changed the entire story, yet Cain chose to ignore him, making that part completely unnecessary. Cain then faced the punishment for what he had done, while God also never informed him that actions do have consequences. He had never stated what would what kinds of actions could be punishable offenses, nor did he state beforehand what the punishable, uh, what the punishments could possibly be. Both Cain and God were to blame in the situation for the meaningless violence that was presented, because either one of them at any moment could have stopped it. Ultimately, the story has a few themes to learn from, but there's one that stands out far more than the rest. The most applicable theme uh, to everyone in the world that has read this story is about reputation. Once someone makes a decision, they can't go back. They may be able to get a second chance, but there will always be someone out there that remembers the first. Cain's first chance was spent killing his brother and becoming the first murderer in the world, according to the Bible. His second chance was spent there, was spending the rest of his life atoning for his sins. Although life can only be lived by uh, can only be lived once by each and every person, their image does not reset to a blank slate after every decision they make. People will always remember when someone does something and it will always become a part of their reputation. Life is limited, but reputation lasts for much, much longer. Whether one's reputation portrays them as a selfless narcissistic as selfless, narcissistic, a saint or a sinner, it is all up to the choices in the life well lived. To end this off with a quote from William Shakespeare, O oh, beware, my lord, of jealousy. It is the green-eyed monster which doth mock the meat it feeds on. Well, it appears that we're changing gears a little bit, changing focus to living and breathing, uh, living, breathing, and succeeding <laughs> with a growth mindset. <laughs> now, of course, I'm certain, and, and, and uh, Reverend uh, Lyde could attest to this, that there is information in the scriptures about living, breathing, and a growth mindset. Okay, so you're, you're in the ballpark. <laughs> Come on forward. <laughs> right. <clears throat> I want to start off by thanking the Gustin Spiritan Division for giving me the opportunity to give this presentation at the Ninth Annual Student Colloquium as well as thank the ladies and gentlemen that make up the audience before me for being here to support such a wonderful event. As you give me your attention, I wish to go over a very important topic we discussed within my Spirit and Division class that I feel many will, many will walk away confidently with a new perspective on mindsets. As Dr. Hotep said, living, living breathing, and succeeding with a growth mindset. Within this presentation, I'll be going over three important metaphors, as well as including a historical event to show the importance of one's mindset moving forward throughout your life experiences. Number one, a fixed mindset. To grasp what a growth mindset is, we must understand what the opposite is to contrast from. It's number two, a growth mindset, and what it looks like, as well as exemplifying famous people that have achieved their goals with this mindset. And last, number three, the improvement mindset. Whereas, whereas you will learn about the three T's to success that you can incorporate in your day-to-day -day life.
All our work is in vain, and we have learned nothing, quoted by Thomas Edison's assistant. Allow me to reiterate where this statement comes from. This statement was born within the fixed mindset spectrum. You may be asking yourself, what is a fixed mindset? A fixed mindset is being highly resistant to change and is a self-perpetuating problem that can hold a person back from achieving their full potential in all areas of life. People with a fixed mindset believe that their abilities, such as intellect, talent, and etc., are simply fixed traits, meaning unchangeable. They are not interested in learning from their mistakes, but they often blame others for their shortcomings. They also think of failure as being an end-all, be-all in any particular endeavor, when failure is always just a stepping stone on the way to success. So now understanding what a fixed mindset is, let us grasp the opposing view. The growth mindset. A growth mindset allows a person to face their fears and not let them stop themselves from achieving their goals. People who have a growth mindset believe that even if they struggle with certain skills, their abilities aren't set in stone. They know that with work, their skills can improve over time. Seeing failure as a necessary part of the learning process can lead us to see some of the greatest creations by mankind, such as Disney, created by Walt Disney, who was, in, who, <clears throat> who was told he lacked imagination and had no good ideas by his first newspaper editor. J.K. Rowling, the lady who wrote the well-known book Harry Potter. She was rejected over nine times before finally making her growth, finally making her dream come true and selling one of the most well-known books to date, where many people know the title, even if they've never read a page. And last but not least, The Light Bulb by Thomas Edison, who had failed over 2,000 times to make his greatest invention yet, which his assistant had called the process a work in vain. But it doesn't stop here. The best mindset of all is found within the improvement mindset. The improvement mindset involves taking the key structure we have learned about a growth mindset and applying the three T's that you're about to learn that I'd wish you would all say with me after I say it. So, take risks. Take care of yourself. And take time. See. Take risks. Remember that nothing gets done unless you go out of your way to make it happen. Even the smallest steps can make the greatest difference. Take care of yourself. Allow yourself to make the changes necessary to create the best you possible. And take time. Take time to create positive thoughts and focus on the bigger picture. When things appear like they're not on your side, reflect and find the strength you once had because I promise you it's no farther than an arm's reach. The best thing about the improvement mindset is that it doesn't care about your past and only concentrates on all the good things you will achieve in your future. To conclude my speech, I will bring in a quote that supports this very mindset. Even though Thomas Edison assistant was an even though Thomas Edison's assistant was applying the fixed mindset view to the process behind discovering the creation of the light bulb, Thomas Edison used his growth mindset principles, as well as the three T's of an improvement mindset, and said very confidently, oh, we have come a long way, and we have learned a lot. We now know that there are 2,000 elements in which we can use, which we cannot use to make a good light bulb. Just in case you didn't grasp the message, I would love to leave you all with another very inspiring quote by a very inspiring person. If you cannot fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, keep moving. Thank you. Well, we're certainly going to uh, take that sage advice and keep it moving, okay? <laughs> uh, Laura Martinez is next, and she's going to share with us uh, some information about a clandestine organization known as the CIA, Central Intelligence Organization, or Association. Oh, no, Agency, Central Intelligence Agency and its involvement in one of our neighboring countries to the south, Guatemala. Okay. Thank you. 
Good evening, my name is Laura Martinez, and today I will be sharing with you a research paper that I did for my writing and analysis class with Dr. Rinda. Okay, so the overthrow of Guatemala, and the research question that kind of guided my paper was, to what extent was the overthrow of Guatemala successful through collective fulfillment, overall success of the country, and a less communist country? So before doing all of that, I started with the background. Um, I researched when the president at the time, uh, sorry, I researched when that from 1951 to 1954, Jacobo Arbenz was the president of Guatemala. This was during the time of the overthrow. Um, and also I had to research his policies, which were included the agrarian reforms, which basically means that um, he relocated, relocated lands for the poor. Uh, and he also increased taxes for large companies, including United Fruit, which was a U.S.-owned company, uh, and that was not good for them, to say the least. And a red flag for the United States government, including the Central Intelligence Agency, was that Guatemala was having relationships with communist countries. And all of those little details kind of led to the overthrow that happened in June 18 of 1954 uh, by the Central Intelligence Agency. So the first criteria that I decided to evaluate the success of the overthrow was collective fulfillment. What I mean by this is were the people um, kind of, did they have an advantage to this overthrow? Were the, did they have a benefit to this overthrow? Um, and what I found was that after the president that was overthrown, Jaco Arbenz, uh, some years passed and then he died. Uh, he had the most attended funeral of the history in Guatemala. And that kind of shows how much people loved him and how during the time he was the president, people were having a great time. They were collectively fulfilled in their lives and in their, with their government. Also, but then after the overthrow, it is said that Guatemala descended into three decades of brutal civil war in which as many as 200,000 people died and many of them peasants killed by security forces. Uh, and that all kind of led me to my conclusion that, that there was no collective fulfillment after the overthrow. And as you can see with this painting by Diego Rivera, it is called Gol Gloriosa Victoria, which means glorious victory. And it basically shows uh, the new leader that is coming uh, to power. And it is the man that is <coughs> to the right, shaking the hand of a CIA, CIA official. And then you can see kind of the banana over there that kind of represent the United Fruit Company. And then like the people in the back, they, they're they not looking happy. And there's, you know, people that died in the overthrow um, in the very bottom. So again, there was no collective fulfillment. Now moving on to the overall success of the country, to sum it up, labor unions, which had flourished since 1944, were crushed and United Fruits lands uh, were restored. So it was a good thing for the US owned company, but it was not a good thing for the citizens of Guatemala. Um, so overall, uh, according to this and more research that I did on my paper, the country did not improve. And then you can see the United Fruits logo and all of that. And then the last uh, thing that I evaluated on the success of the overthrow was, did it become a less communist country? Uh, the new leader that was installed by the CIA was Colonel Castillo Armas. He, it was said that his rule turned Guatemala from a democratic spring into a persecution. And it also is said that his leadership included a series of coups and counter coups coupled with brutal repression of the country's people. But he did create the National Committee of Defense Against Communism. He found many um, people that were involved with communism and many were tried for that. So he did fight against communism. So in this respect, it was successful. The overthrow was successful in this respect. So yes, there was much less communism according to my research that I did. And yeah, that was it. So thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. Um, comprehensive sex education in the Pennsylvania public schools. Hands, are you ready? Okay.
Good evening, students, staff, and faculty. Hello. For those that don't know me, my name is Hans Cherix, and I hope to facilitate a healthy conversation about comprehensive sex education in Pennsylvania public schools. But in order to do so, I'm going to share a story about my friend John. John called me to stress one night, stating that he was scared he had potentially contracted an STI when meeting up with a partner. Worried about the prevalence of HIV in same-sex attracted individuals, he was confused on what to do. I learned through my summer internship at Planned Parenthood about the importance of PrEP and getting tested for STIs regularly. When I asked John when he was last tested or if he's on PrEP, which stands for pre-exposure for laxus, he did not know what it was or how to use proper protection with his partner. There are two problems with John's story. Problem one, if pre-exposure for laxus is 97% effective in preventing and treating HIV, why is it being talked about in standard sex ed conversations? And did John not know how to handle the situation with his partner because of a classically heteronormative sex ed curriculum? This is why co comprehensive sex education, also known as CSE, is so important. When considering that only seven states, according to AmericanProgress.org, require medically accurate sex ed, it is important we establish a comprehensive, inclusive sex ed curriculum across Pennsylvania public schools. CSE brings three main points to the table and it is with my hope by the end of this presentation, you can understand the importance of CSE. Number one, abstinence-based sex ed has been proven not to work. The Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance Survey says that 51% of teens has engaged in sexual intercourse before they graduated high school. If teenagers are already having consent consensual sexual intercourse, it is quite evident that the abstinence method is not working. Not educating teens on STI transmissions will not allow consenting teens to know the signs and symptoms of STIs and how to stop the spread. Number two, failure to educate on dangers of unsafe sexual practices. In order to get to my next point, I think it's important to understand what safe sex is in the first place. However, Planned Parenthood prefer, prefers the term safer sex instead of safe sex because there is no 100% safe method to conduct safe sex. Safer sex refers to anything we can do to lower our risk and our partner's risk of sexually transmitted infections. This can include, but is not limited to, con condoms, dental dams, or regular STI testing. As well as evidence-based pregnancy prevention intervention, dramatically reduced rates of teen pregnancy in Hispanic and black individuals ages 15 and 19 years old, according to the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Age-appropriate CSE would lower teen pregnancy rates and transmissions of STIs as opposed to abstinence-based education. Number three, CSE would promote LGBTQ plus inclusivity. Including and acknowledging same-sex relationships in CSE would serve all students, not just the majority. In order to show the importance of keeping LGBTQ individuals in the conversation, here's, here are some statistics to show how CSE can help the community. MSM, also known as men who have sex with men, account for two-thirds of HIV infections in ages 13 through 29. HIV is four times more prevalent in transgender people than cisgender people, and bisexual individuals have the highest risk of experiencing dating violence. Since LGBTQ plus people are most negatively affected by unsafe or dangerous practices, it is vital to address these relationships in comprehensive sex education. However, CSE can also improve prejudice against LGBTQ plus couples. For example, the state of Alabama. The state of Alabama teaches that homosexuality is not a lifestyle accepted by the general public and the homosexual acts are one of a criminal defense, despite the Supreme Court disbanding that rule 10 years ago. Leaving LGBTQ youth out of discussion can imply that they are abnormal or not worthy of being talked about, which can have a huge significance on their mental health. In conclusion, providing CSE in public schools cannot be an easy feat. However, bringing CSE to the state level can help provide medically accurate, inclusive sexual education and make that a possibility. Thank you. Our last presenter will be returning to the theme of Greek mythology with a discussion of the tragedy of Achilles. Uh, the program reads Mr. Frankie Scragg, but as we can see, is actually Miss Frankie Scragg. Come on up. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hi, good evening. My name is Frankie Scragg, and tonight I will be discussing the paper I wrote in Professor Martin's class, and that is The Tragedy of Achilles. Now, for those of you who don't know, Achilles is a Greek hero in mythology who fought in the Trojan War. He tragically died with a arrow cursed by Apollo, shot by Paris, the prince of Troy, in the heel, and he tragically died. And his companion, Patroclus, was killed by Paris's brother, Hector, with a spear to the gut. He was also a warrior in the Trojan War, though not as famous as Achilles. Now, Achilles and Patroclus' relationship is said by historians in the early 1990s uh, and early 2000s that they were just friends. In fact, a bromance between them happened. And if you've ever seen the 2004 film Troy, the adaptation of the Trojan War, starring Brad Pitt, they went as far as portraying the two as cousins. Well, I'm here to discuss the real tragedy of Achilles, and it's that these historians have tried to rewrite history. In the opinions of Plato, and the only other philosopher and writer I can pronounce here is Phaedrus, so I'm sorry, um, they say the exact opposite, that they were lovers. And they even went as far, Phaedrus criticizes a I'm so sorry, he wrote a play, and it his concerns were about it were that they were sexually involved. They were that he, they, he portrayed the roles that they played in the relationship wrongly. They discussed who was the lover or Erotis, older and active, and who was the beloved or Eremos, younger and passive. Now, the reasons why historians, oh, never mind. The history of homosexuality in ancient Greece. Now, I know you're thinking, since it was so far in the past, that homosexuality was not accepted and that it was very uncommon. In fact, it was quite the opposite. It was very, very common, especially in bathhouses, gymnasiums, and in the military. It's even speculated that there could happen some form of marriage. And Achilles and Patroclus aren't the only lovers that have been covered up in their history. There's also the Sacred Band of Thebes, which was a military unit all composed of male lovers. And there is also the god Apollo and his lover Hyacinth, who also tragically died. But there are so many more examples. Socrates was known to have many male lo lovers, and even Alexander the Great was known to have a male lover. Now. The reasons why these historians have said that they were just friends is because of Homer's The Odyssey. Now, in The Odyssey, it never explicitly says that they have an intimate relationship of lovers, but it does hint at a very intimate bond between the two. This is a quote from it that Achilles says about Patroclus' death. He says, my dear comrade's dead, Patroclus, the man I loved beyond all other comrades, loved as my own life, I've lost him. And this is interpreted as not only were they lovers, but Ach Achilles deeply loved Patroclus as he loved his own soul. Now, there are many more examples since this is the reason why people say that they were just friends. I'm gonna use it as the main example to explain how there are more situations that happened that explain. For example, the rage of Achilles. Now, if any of you know of mythology, you've probably heard the rage of Achilles, and it's all because of Patroclus. When Patroclus is, dies, Achilles is so enraged, he is just on hell-bent on avenging him. So he goes and finds Hector. And Hector, he obviously defeats Hector, but when he's about to kill him, Hector begs for, not for his life, really, but for Achilles to take him to his friends and his family so that he could have the proper burial rights of a prince of Troy and that, he can, and that his people can grieve him. Achilles, so enraged, refused him. And as Hector is begging not to let his body be carrion for the birds and the dogs, Achilles says, no, I would devour you myself, but since I can't, I will let the birds and the dogs have you. And he does some very gruesome things to Hector's body, but in summary, he ties Hector to the back of his chariot and parades him around the walls of Troy three times for his wife, his father, and his brothers to see. Now, during all of this, 
Patroclus's body still hasn't been buried. So it takes Patroclus showing up in ghost form to Achilles and requesting. He says, a last request, grant it please. Never bury my bones apart from yours, Achilles. Let them lie together. So now let a single urn, the gold two-handed urn your noble mother gave you, hold our bones together forever. And when Paris kills Achilles at the heel, that's exactly what Achilles does. He puts his ashes in the same urn as Patroclus so that they never may be apart. And that's pretty much it. Thank you so much. Now, if the seven presenters would be so kind as to drag a chair to the front, we'll have our Q&A session. <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I suppose, does anybody have a question? I have a comment first. I'll, I'll say I took notes <laughs> on all the presenters, and I thought all the teachers, everyone that taught them, did a great job. And I know all the parents have to be so very proud of um, all of you in presenting. And I learned so much from each and every one of you. And uh, the one question that, that I do have, uh, I know Sasha talked about the reign of King David. And being that you're all here on campus, if one of you or a couple of you could share, what is your Goliath as you go through this first your this semester right here? What is been your Goliath? Now we know finals are coming, but <laughs> what is uh, what do you think your Goliath is, and how do you plan on conquering? Yeah. Um, mine is the eight-page paper. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Professor Martin wants me to write. Um, I've not conquered it. I, um, I have to sit down and start conquering it. Yeah, but that's, that's my Goliath because I've never job. written. Everybody knows what Goliath is. Yeah, because I've never written something that long before. So. I'd say my Goliath is I don't even live on campus. I actually still live at home but I have to commute every single day, and it tends to not go well at times. Sometimes the bus is 20 minutes late. Sometimes it breaks down. I can't control these things. It once skipped my stop even. I could miss class. I have, I, the next stop is over 20 minutes away from Duquesne. What am I supposed to do? So I don't know how to conquer that. There, I don't think there's any way to, but I'd say that's my biggest problem in college currently. I'd say my Goliath is also the paper um, and just getting through this final week. Yeah. Um, I would say my personal Goliath is all of the lovely hills that this campus has to offer, um, including any form of rain, snow, participation of any kind, including well, in, co in combination with those hills, um, is something that me and my converse know very, very well. So. Uh, I'd say, surprisingly enough, uh, the eight-page paper I'm fine with. Um, my, my Goliath is pretty much my entire theology class. <laughs> not, not because of the class itself, mostly because Normal outside of outside of the class itself, it's not something I really like that much. So, uh, I'd say that my Goliath hasn't come yet, so I'm still about to have that battle. It's going to be my discrete math class coming up. It's for uh, 
So yeah, I have to buckle down for that one, let me tell you. And I got mandatory tutors, so I got help on this war. <laughs> I would have to agree with hands. My Goliath, well, my Goliath is the wind. It's like so bad. I had to get glasses because my eyes like just water and like I start crying from the wind and it's just crazy, but yeah, that's my biggest Goliath. Oh. That's it? Everyone does it? Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? It's kind of off topic of your subject, but oh, I just, okay. just want to know your opinion. Uh, what's your opinion on Venezuela at this moment of time? What do you mean by that? Or what's going on down there with about I mean, a possible CIA coup? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the situation over there is really sad that it's happening. Um, yeah, it's just seeing like all my Venezuelan friends going through that, not being able to go back to their country and see right. what it was. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure what the CIA's plans, if they're planning anything or they right. talked about it or anything like that. But yeah, I mean, in this moment in time, it's more complicated to do overthrows like that because yeah. like of like all the things that are happening in the world with like Iran and all these countries. So yeah, I mean, it's hard, but yeah, I don't, I don't know how to answer that, but yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Oh no, you're fine, you're good. This must be the hot table. <laughs> or we'll give you the mic <laughs> or switch the mic. Um, listening to all of you and your um, studying and thought provoking questions, or what I wanted to say is that have you found in your research through this? that it's amazing from the beginning of time till now there is nothing new under the sun. The things that are happening now have happened before and they will happen again. Did you find that very interesting that this world seems people will say we're in the last days? Well, 500 years ago, 2,000 years ago they could say we were in the last days because of the turmoil. Did you find that uh, thought-provoking and interesting? I'm a huge. Is this on? Okay. I'm a huge fan of Greek mythology, and it doesn't sound like. Oh no! Yeah. It's me then. Can I do that? Okay. I guess I'm just going up. Did I do it? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, as a Greek mythology kind of buff, I'm a huge nerd about it. Um, yeah, it does amaze me how much of the Greek culture like has moved into now, and how like nothing really changes, and how each religion has like a story or a life lesson of like what not to do, and there's always like a morally gray kind of trickster in every mythology, but. Um, you reminded me of a quote that I really like, and it's that the real lesson in history is that nobody learns, so, <laughs> yeah. I think, like, I'm definitely amazed to see that, like, to see the similarities between the past and the present, like, again, with so many presidential elections, for example, in my home country of Colombia, um, we just got a new president. Um, and it was a very like disputed presidency because it was between a man that was known at, to be very, uh, what's the word? Like he, he was all about the money and all that. And then it was against a man that was communist and he was part of a guerrilla group. Uh, so it's like very disputed and then you can't really predict, you can't actually, yes you can. You can predict a lot of the future, but like you can't, be too accurate with it, but like with communism, there's a lot of countries going through that. There's a lot of countries that you want to do something about them, but like with North Korea, like there's so many different like situations, so many different policies, and it's crazy how what happened in the past is currently happening and even more. So as another major Greek mythology nerd, <laughs> I. I think over time, 
humans have an innate nature to them. It just repeats throughout time. We make the same mistakes over and over, even though we already know the mistakes we've made before. I think it just happens over and over throughout time because that's how people are. I think Greek mythology, it shows the gods are human. They make the same mistakes as us. And it, show, it goes to show that we all just go in a cycle over and over. The gods make the same mistakes over and over. People make the same mistakes over and over. It's just how history is, how people is in general. So alluding to my topic about the growth mindset, you know, I believe that that process of moving from fix to growth to improvement is also inclined with this of like you're inevitably going to end up telling yourself, you know, oh, I can't do something or I won't be able to do something. And that's that fixed mindset. Even people such as like um, Steve Jobs, who, who made Apple, he went through that himself where he was actually fired from Apple and then came up with an insane product once again and was re-brought back on. I'm sure, I'm guaranteeing you that when he was fired, he thought that there would be no chance that he'd be able to come back to his company. So there's just um, that nature of when you're in that improvement mindset, when you're, when you're doing your best, you know, I'll incorporate a personal thing where you know, I code in a, in a spare time and I really, really have to have that improvement growth mindset because when I first started, let me tell you, I thought there's no way I'm learning this. This is way too advanced for me. Fixed mindset, sure enough. Now I'm at the point where I'm like, okay, I got this, but I can tell you that I've always gone back to that fixed mindset sometimes with now there's a new thing. So I'd like to say that the process does repeat a lot within my, within my topic here. Um, this relates a little bit to my topic, but as a practicing Jew, I'd say a big part of our history is just, I guess, I, a big part of like being an American Jew is knowing the history, especially of like Israel. Um, so just always remembering that, I guess, is a big part. I think similar to my topic, um, there, there's definitely a quote that would work with this from Winston Churchill, which is, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat its mistakes. So, I mean, things happen in the past that can be good or bad, but if no one learns from history, they're just going to end up doing the same things all over again. I think with pertaining to my topic, um, that of which being sex ed, I, um, I feel like science and education is something that like goes back forever, and we have to know like what happened like in the past in order to like to build on to our new current subjects, and especially with science, I feel like it's very cumulative. Um, so, kind of knowing like where we came from in order to how to protect our futures is something that's really important. Oh yeah, um, when I said like it is believed that there is some s sort of marriage that it's speculated that could possibly happen between uh, same-sex couples, that, that was in consideration of women too. I don't particularly remember all of the women who had sexual relationships because their, name their names are very long and I'm very dyslexic. <laughs> So, but they're out there, I promise. <laughs> Any other? I'm loud enough, you don't need to give me a microphone, I promise. Oh yeah, I can um, hear you. So, we tend to talk about cycles that repeat themselves over and over again, which is obviously speaking of things. Aside from learning of history, how do we stop the crazy hamster wheel of constantly making the exact same I don't know. <laughs> Somebody That's a loaded question. Well, how do you guys personally say it, yeah. I should say? Not the, it's not philosophy in a hundred words or less. So continue. I mean, I would say, like, I don't know the answer to that, but I feel like the best 
we can do is learn ev like as much as we can. Like for example, I had no idea about the overthrows till I read this book called The Overthrow by Stephen Kinzer. And I had no idea the US did overthrows like in the 1950s and all of that. Uh, and it really explains a lot about Central America. Like it really gave me an explanation of uh, the current situations that are happening there. Um, so yeah, like just learning your history. I don't know, I think that's the most important thing. I'd say common sense is a good thing to have. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. No, it's not common anymore. <laughs> common sense is a good thing to have. If you see someone like, I don't know, murder someone, and you see the consequences, you know, you shouldn't do that also. <laughs> I mean, it's just common sense. And that, that's just how I see it. Don't be stupid. Don't make the same mistakes others before you made. I would say, I would allude to the concept of trying to approach it with a different mindset than what has been done. Like, for example, with learning, you know, like um, take on a task with a whole brand new uh, approach. For example, you know, nothing, how do I explain? In my words, I'd say nothing great uh, has ever came from repeating somebody's steps before. Something great comes out of originality. So I just feel to escape the, the hamster wheel, for example, just create something new, you know, even if that. Is, you know, I don't know how to explain this without sounding terrible, but like even if that has to do with uh, like a war approach of things, you know, take on a new perspective on that. Take on a new perspective of everything, and you'll find that uh, you'll move into a non-repetitive nature, I'd like to say. I'd say continue learning and also listening. People are very quick to talk and not listen. I'd, I'd say it's the same answer as the last. I mean, I, I'd say Churchill was on to something. Uh, I mean, first guy to say OMG must have been on to something when he put his mind to it, right? So. Um, I would probably echo similar thoughts from all my classmates, but I think using that hamster wheel analogy, if we kind of take ourselves into like a third person perspective, like almost like bird's eye view and see why the hamster wheel is spinning in the first place. We can isolate that problem and do it step by step rather than trying to tackle a huge hamster wheel, so. That is a really good question. Thank you, Sky. Um, <laughs> um, I was in Professor Lyde's public speaking class, and we had to do a persuasive essay. And I noticed through my personal educational experience, as well as my internship with Planned Parenthood, that there was definitely a big gap and a lacking of education where um, it's, se sex ed only seemed to cater to certain people or only people of a certain like class or stature can afford good education. So in order to, we needed to make a curriculum that served everybody and not just some people. Um, and then I found out about the idea of comprehensive sex ed and how it caters to not just, you know, like STIs or like safe sex practices, but also talks about like relationship types, consent, LGBTQ individuals. I realized that served more people than it did before. So, uh, I chose mine because I'm not the. I wouldn't say I'm really a big fan of the Bible, but no one has ever said that murder is boring, right? So. Um, it was very hard for me to get behind the fact of taking a theology class, but I walked in the first day and we started learning about the Old Testament, and I was like, wait, I know this. 
Um, and King David was just caught my eye, the most interesting thing. My spirits and division class taught us a lot of different things about how to like maintain college and you know watch your social profile, but nothing stood out the most to me is the growth mindset because again, like everybody's affected by their mindset depending on how you approach a situation and it's important to acknowledge that. And once you do acknowledge that, I just wanted to, you know, let people know that if you're experiencing that fixed mindset, that you're not only alone, but there are ways to fix that. So that's one of the things is just educating the public on that. So I'm not a big fan of theology, honestly, but I really like Greek mythology. And I've noticed throughout the years when looking at various religions and theologies, there's a pattern. Like a lot of the time there's a great flood. And I thought that it would be really interesting to bring up two Greek stories that related to the Bible that were very similar. Because Greek mythology, again, is a very big passion of mine. I've been studying it since middle school. So I may not be very familiar with the Bible, but I'm very familiar with Greek mythology. And I wanted to show that, you know, despite being very different, there are similarities between most religions, especially using Greek as an example. Um, so I kind of went this semester uh, with the thought that I wanted to do every paper, every, every speech based on my career. My career is international relations and I want to, my concentration to be Latin America. So basically, all the papers I've done are on Latin America and all of that. So I wanted to focus for this analysis paper, I wanted to focus on something I knew about, which was the overthrow of Guatemala. But I wanted to kind of look at it from a different perspective, from the perspective of, that I didn't really talk about, the perspective of the US, of Eisenhower and all of that, and really get into like why they did it. Because when I first read the, the book and the story about the overthrow, I was like, why would they do that? Like, he was such a good president. Like, yeah, there was communism, but it really wasn't as big of a thing. So, but then when I kind of read like everything that was going on, um, I kind of understood their side point of view a little bit. I may not agree with that overthrow specifically, but that made me understand the overthrows that have been done in history and just kind of like the CIA's role in the US government, and yeah. Uh, I'm a huge nerd for Greek <laughs> mythology. So when Professor Martin was like, let's do a paper evaluation, I was like, the, that was the first thing that popped into my head, because I was also rereading Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. Highly recommend the book, by the way, so. I mean, if you look at like every kind of theology and religion, I mean, they're so, so similar. And considering that like with mythology, like Greek myth, like there's it, each, each kind of everything incorporates into each other. Like mistletoe, that's from North's mythology. You see a statue of Herme Hermes above every train station. So um, I don't know. Natasha, do you want to answer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my answer is kind of similar, pretty much. It all bleeds together throughout history. Everything does. R mythology, religion, you know, it's all going to bleed together because over time, people move places, people spread stories, word of mouth. And so, in the end, they all bleed together. They come from similar ideas because people from all over the place have gone, hey, you know, I like this idea. What if we did it this way? It changes, I mean, my answer is pretty similar to Frankie's, but yeah, pretty much all bleeds and runs together because of over time, word of mouth and such.
one of the things that a lot of them had in common that you can kind of probably visualize is astronomical events, especially astronomical events leading to cosmic, uh, cataclysmic events on a, on a large scale on our planet. So things like comets, meteorite impacts, these are things that you could see from almost anywhere in the world around the same time. And there's some good research out there to show that some of these things that are depicted, even though they might have been on opposite sides of the planet, they all would have experienced the same thing. And that might be one of the things that ties the symbol of the day. The thing that I wanted to ask, I love this because you know we've done nine and we presented every one of them, uh, whether they're online or here, and each one of them has kind of its own rhythm and its own pattern. And I want to continue, I wasn't planning to do this, but we've fallen into a wonderful uh, pattern with this, with asking primarily questions for everybody to answer in a row. That's really cool, I like that. So I'm gonna ask one that can apply to everyone and see if it, what do you wish you had time to do for this study that you didn't get around to yet that maybe you might later? What did you not get to get to dig into for time or other limitations this go around that if you were to do further research on the same topic, what would you like to be able to get into more? Um, like I said, I'm kind of like, I love Greek mythology and I love honestly any type of studying of mythologies or religion. And with this, I am so fascinated in like, because with that quote I showed you, I think it's evident that Achilles and Patroclus with like the one, like my comrade's dead, like I mourn him, like I mourn my own soul. I think it's evident that Achilles like loved Patroclus so much. And of course I read the song of Achilles and it's Madeline Miller, Miller's fictional version of their relationship. And I would really like to, I've already read the Iliad several times, but I would really like to dive into it and try to see it from somebody else's perspective that's not already like kind of rooting for them and see like, oh, can this be ter interpreted as kind of a like, yeah, bro, go get him <laughs> way. So I don't know, that's what I would like to do. I think I would love to kind of get into more of the CIA's role today because I focus on the past too much. And yeah, like I, after this, I really want to research Venezuela and like what's the CIA thinking of that. But yeah, I'm really curious about like the CIA and how it's changed over time. But yeah. I did run across an interesting fact when I was looking through things. The, the two Greek stories I brought up are actually linked together. Um, Pyra is actually Pandora and Epimethus' daughter. And I really kind of want to dig into that and figure out how that, how that worked out. Because uh, their daughter is literally married to Prometheus' son also. It, like, it's really tied together. I, I'm just kind of curious of how that went. It's like your soap opera. Yeah. <laughs> Greek mythology is all just a crazy soap opera. Yeah. It really is. Yes, Zeus. Don't get started on Zeus. <laughs> or the whole um, uh, Athena and Poseidon. They have a rivalry going. Um, hey, Troy. Troy, Troy yeah, about. Troy. Um, God, what was it? I can't think of it now. <laughs> there was this one. Aphrodite, uh, Ares, and Hephaestus. Yeah, they have a thing going also, because Aphrodite's supposed to be married to Hephaestus, and uh, she she's not a fan. Uh, she, that was arranged, and she was not. A yeah, fan. she was a huge, hey, huge against. Hey, Hephaestus it. got Aphrodite to marry her. He said, a "Couple, of, just a phrase. I I work late." <laughs> 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 But yeah, I thought that was uh, a really interesting fact in general. I mean, yeah. So with my topic, um, I would have dived into more people that can embody a growth mindset and also um, an improvement mindset because it would have gave more of an example of what you know those th those things really can be. And also, I would have dove into the psychology side of it of when you actually 
embody yourself within the growth mindset, you'll you'll find that you're waking up and you're, you're feeling a lot better. You're you're approaching tasks with more of a, a an approachable uh, mindset versus looking at it in a way of okay, I can't. Well, in fact, you can. You know, the the T in can't I'd like to believe is just a cross. So when you see it like that, you'll understand that it's just the word can with faith behind it. So that's something that I like to think about. There was definitely a lot of information about King David. Um, one thing that I didn't really get to dig too deep into was his relationships with his sons. I think that would have been super interesting, especially like the after effect and then how he treated Solomon. It would have been super interesting. I actually... Well, part of the reason I, I liked writing about Cain and Abel is that it was something I didn't have to choose a part of it to write about. I wrote from start to finish. It was, it was 18 Bible verses, and it's a full short story. Uh, so they start, out, they start out as farmers and end out as one dead, one walking the earth eternally. Um, I think if I had more time... Uh, I would look more into what a good curriculum actually looks like mm. because I examined a lot of more negative examples of like what could happen if there isn't any good curriculum set in place. So like I talked about like abstinence doesn't work. Okay, well what does? Mm. Um, and kind of examining that more in depth. My biggest obstacle, uh, hold on, I gotta think for a minute, because this is already like a topic that I'm so passionate about ever since I was a little baby, <laughs> and I found that hyacinth is, it's my favorite flower, it has been since I was so, because it smells divine, and then I learned that Hyacinth like was a person and so I've known about this mythology kind of ever since I was probably 10 and I basically I wrote his paper basically all from memory so the probably the biggest obstacle was Trying to discover evidence that I didn't previously know about like I went into all the like evidence of why they were lovers and like because I was so set in that opinion but I never I had trouble finding stuff that kind of had the other side to it because a lot of them didn't really give any evidence all they said was Homer never explicitly says but they never gave evidence and all they said it was a Bromance, so. <laughs> I think bias is always kind of like a thing I struggle with, and I had an opinion about this beforehand. So I guess it was hard, like, not only finding information about, like, the success of it. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was really hard to find, like, more details about, like, the CIA's, like, success of it and, like, if, I don't know, like something like that. I'd say the major problem with Greek mythology is because it was so word of mouth back in the day, there are so many different versions of everything. There are so many different detail changes and everything. And so in one version, maybe it wasn't Epimethus that got Pandora. I don't know, that would be weird, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, it's all the changes in Greek mythology. They're all different stories. There's so many different versions. Like, there's a Percy Jackson book of a whole bunch of stories from Greek 
yeah, you know which one I'm talking about, of Greek, of Greek gods and goddesses, and uh, the stories are very washed down, because, you know, it's meant for kids, and some details change, and it even states in the book that you may know it one way, and there's all kinds of different versions. It could be different in this book, it could be the same, it, it just changes per version. And so that makes it hard to come down with a definitive pinpoint for what you want to talk about, because details can change. My biggest difficulty was to condense information. For those who know me, I typically can go on a spiel that can last a, a lifetime. So therefore, <laughs> with the help of Professor Lyde, I was able to condense this. Because again, mindset's a huge topic. I mean, psychology is a brand new study within itself. So therefore, you know, there's a lot to talk about. And I just feel that one thing I struggled with was to be able to just pull one example out, and I felt, the, I felt the best one to do was Thomas Edison, because again, if he would have gave into a fixed mindset and just said the work was in vain, well, it would probably be dark in here with candlelight. <laughs> um, I'd say my biggest difficulty was probably just getting up there and doing the presentation. <laughs> I mean, my biggest difficulty was finding sources that, like multiple sources that didn't just say the exact same thing. Because, it, like, I found four or five articles at first, or like uh, articles or documentation um, about, like, analysis of Cain and Abel, and they all said the exact same thing, just with slightly different wording. I, like, I'm, I'm convinced that a few of them uh, plagiarized off each other. <laughs> but um, but I, I'd say other than that, other than that, the other struggle I had was I wanted to, I wanted to sort of uh, analyze it myself and come up with something that I could notice that wasn't listed in the sources. And for me, uh, that thing was, uh, was the whole connection with Cain being the worker of the ground, being the best at what he does for that. And even when he tried to hide what he did in his greatest, in, in the work that he was the best at, like even that wasn't good enough to, to hide it, so. I would say one of my biggest problems was just getting started. Um, I had a plethora of information in front of me and I couldn't figure out what to do with it. Um, I had so many thoughts, they were all like kind of like scrambled eggs. Um, and yeah, it wasn't fun, but I had to, I guess, work through that. And I guess that's also one of my biggest problems when it comes to like my personal coursework too, is just kind of like finding a narrative and sticking to it, so. Job well done. Okay, great work, great start. We need to move towards closure, and at this point, we're going to have closing remarks from one of our distinguished GSD instructors, Dr. Guzzi. Thanks, Dr. Hotep. This uh, room is not for the vertically challenged. I feel like I need a couple telephone books to stand up here so you could see me. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. That's, that's a better way of saying it. Um, also, I think it's very impressive that uh, Dr. Martin and uh, Linda Donovan are, is everyone's personal Goliath. I think that's, a, that's something to, uh, to strive for. It's great. Man, what kind of work do you guys give them? Um, all the GSD students did an amazing job tonight. Uh, let's hear it for them again. <laughs> Really impressive work, well articulated and done with confidence and with vigor. Um, things along the lines of Greco mythology and Christian theology, uh, really cool overlap there. Uh, King David, I mean, how can you not love King David? Um, you know, adultery and murder aside, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, Cain and Abel, 
Uh, the growth mindset and the positive attributes. I love this part about the improvement mindset that you brought up, um, how it leads into that. Uh, the CIA overthrow the Guatemalan government. Uh, I don't need to watch Netflix tonight. I've got it right here. Um, sex ed in public schools, not a controversial topic at all. Well, a job, good job, Hans. And uh, an awesome presentation on Achilles. Really good work. Um, coming back to a point uh, that someone had asked about before, just as an aside, um, these connections between uh, mythologies and these stories, uh, if anybody wants to get into this, just to nerd out for like one second, uh, Carl Jung, the great psychologist, in his memoir, Memory, Dreams, and Reflections, talks about this. And his uh, theory is actually that the reason why uh, these stories have so much in common is because there's an element of truth, objective truth embedded in the human mind. <laughs> and that's why it's a commonality, that it's natural to us as human beings uh, to have these truth stories come out uh, across universally uh, all of these different uh, aspects of culture. So to come full circle, uh, we've engaged in a true colloquium. Yes. We have walked together and talked together. A significant part of a colloquium involves asking questions, having a dialogue, and answering those questions the best we can together. Um, but we do so with humility. We humbly seek the truth. As a Catholic university, we engage in what St. Anselm called faith-seeking understanding. <laughs> the mind, the heart, the soul work together in service to the exploration of the truth. This service is done best in a truly diverse setting. This service is something that is revealed to us in what uh, Jacques Derrida called difference. We're all so different, and that's when the truth comes and rises to the surface. Uh, we started the colloquium with Dr. Hotep M. Singh, Linda Donovan praying, and Mr. Lyde preaching. Uh, so I'm going to take literally like 30 seconds to preach my own brief sermon. You shouldn't have asked two preachers to do this, Dr. Hotel. So this is it. Um, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is brought before the Roman proconsul Pontius Pilate. Uh, not to get too gory, but this story is gory. <laughs> okay? uh, he's beaten, bruised, mocked, humiliated, and now interrogated by Pontius Pilate. And Jesus at this moment is representing all of broken humanity. We talked a bit about the history. Why do we keep repeating all these mistakes over and over and over again? And there Jesus is. He's representative of a broken humanity. And Pilate asks Jesus a few questions. They have their own colloquium. <laughs> they have their own little dialogue going on. And these are the questions. So I hear you are a king. Are you a king? Where do you come from? Jesus answers, I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. Well, Pilate says, if your kingdom is not of this world, then where did you come from and why did you come here? Jesus says, I have come to testify to the truth. And then the last question, Pilate asks Jesus, what is truth? And there's a dramatic pause. Dramatic pause. Christians uh, believe that this pause represents one thing, that Pilate was actually looking into the eyes of the truth, the embodiment of truth, the essence of truth. Our job as faculty members and administrators at the GSD is to encourage these existential, existential questions, the questions that make us uncomfortable sometimes. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? What is my value? What is the truth? I am proud to be part of the GSD uh, because we get to remind students day in and day out, and this is your reminder to each one of you, that they have intrinsic value, uh, that their lives have meaning and have purpose, that they are made in the image and likeness of God, that their intellect and character have value in service to the rest of the world that literally you are called to be world changers. And I believe that every one of you will be. So thank you.
Okay, before we have our benediction, uh, benediction and, and closure, I would like to acknowledge those who participated in putting the program together, beginning first with my grad assistant, Athena. Okay. Okay. We have a GSD staff person here, uh, Mrs. Rizzo, who works with students. Okay. And, and I also want to thank the GSD faculty for their hard work, enjoyable work, uh, helping students prepare for this colloquium. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and last but not least, the, the parents who came out and family to support the young people. Yeah. We thank you. We thank you. Am I leaving anyone out? Pardon me? And the students in the audience, would, would they stand, the students in the audience? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Now, we'll move towards closure and our benediction. As we bow our heads in prayer, good and gracious God, we give you thanks as we acknowledge the gifts in each one of us. We are thankful for each person here, students, family, faculty, administration. We acknowledge that we've gained knowledge this semester and we're thankful for the growing academic confidence and for times of peace amid the chaos. As we leave tonight, let your blessing flow on each one of us as we do our work to advance our knowledge and the academic achievements of our students, faculty, and administration. We ask your blessings as we leave, and we thank you for this night. Amen. <laughs>